Well, hello. Welcome to part two of the chapter 14 review. In this section, we're going to be looking at the principles of solar energy and trying to understand a little bit about, um, about how solar energy works and also uh, what can we expect in terms of some of, the, some of the components that we put in our systems. What I have for you, first of all, though, is we're going to take a look at this uh, chart. Um, this uh, bar, uh, excuse me, this uh, graph has to do with the, the amounts and kinds of light energy that hits our planet. If we take a look at this, this graph, you'll see that um, the ultraviolet range right here, uh, that obviously allows us a certain amount of, of energy. If you take a look at the other end of the, the light spectrum, you'll notice that the infrared, which is responsible a lot for the heat part of light, um, is on that end. It's of a little bit lower form. But the vast majority of our energy comes from this middle part, which is visible light. The visible light, or the light that we can see, it is really the one that's the most energetic. The other two are important, but the point I'm trying to make here are there are different types, or three different types, infrared, visible, and ultraviolet, visible being the most energetic. And when we know that, we also have to understand, in this particular case, um, that this energy, number one, is constant. As long as it's sunlight, as long as the, there is light hitting our planet, it is, we're constantly being bombarded by photons. Those photons are creating or giving us an opportunity to make energy out of it. Just like plants make um, chemical energy, we can make electrical energy from those photons if we understand the principles behind it. Also, it's extremely abundant. It's been said that if we looked at seven days worth of light, if we could only capture two full days of light, there's a good chance that we can meet our energy needs for the entire year for just two full days out of a seven-day week. It's also free. And last time I looked, Mr. Sun hasn't been sending us a bill. That's what we have PG&E for, by the way. Um, but the Sun itself gives it pretty much free. And then as far as we're all concerned, it's pretty much everlasting lasting. We're not necessarily going to see the end of it in our lifetime, uh, at least we hope not anyway, but either will our, you know, our, our, our families uh, many generations from now. There are some things that we need to overcome when using solar energy. It's, it's not extremely um, with, without problems, so we're, we need to look at some of those as well. So when we take a look at some of the hurdles, first of all, we need to find some way of collecting it. So collection is one of those things that um, we kind of took our, our uh, we kind of uh, took a cue from um, plants. Um, collection was because you have to have a certain amount of surface area. Flat surface area works the best. We we found out just like leaves and plants, and by collecting those photons as as they hit, then we at least halfway there in the actual conversion portion of it. The second part is we now need to convert it. By converting it, we can take all of that solar energy and convert it into possibly chemical energy or electrical energy. Again, looking at plants, they take the solar energy and using the process of photosynthesis within some very specialized thylakoids, um, they're able to convert that solar energy from the photons and convert it into chemical energy in, in, in actually making sugar or, or glucose molecules. And then we have a storage problem. Now, what plants do is they link up all of these glucose molecules in, into starches and, and into, to, into bonds, and that was their way of storing all of this uh, chemical energy they make. Well, we have to do something a little bit differently in solar energy. We have all of this electrical energy. We've got to store it some way, and currently right now the, the technology of choice are batteries. And batteries are great, but when you're talking about large amounts of opportunities for us to kind of store it, um, that means a lot of batteries, which also means in 10 or 15 years, lots of waste because all of a sudden now we've got to take those batteries and recycle them. And uh, that creates a problem in landfills. It creates a problem with getting rid of all the chemicals and the acids that are within batteries. And then uh, lastly is how cost effective can we be? Again, I talked in the first one a little bit about uh, how it's important for us to be practical. Well, this is kind of where the rubber meets the road. We, maybe we can make the conversions. Maybe we can do the storage. All of the pieces is, that's necessary. But if we can't be, we can't 
If we can't make it affordable for people, then it's not going to be used. And then, of course, that technology is going to find some some place in the waste bin. So it's, it's important for us to make sure that it's cost effective and work on the practical side of things. Uh, there are two terms that you're going to need to know when we're talking about solar or heating in particular, active and passive. Let's talk about active first. Um, when we talk about active systems, we're talking about systems that need energy. So they're going to need some sort of energy to power their systems, like moving water or air through pumps or blowers or fans. So the energy that we generate is going to cost us something in return because we're putting energy into it. Uh, the next part uh, would be passive. Passive tends to use not so much the, um, I guess it's not very uh, highly technical. Um, you can have kind of low tech, um, but it's also relatively cheaper because we're talking about basically um, moving air and water through natural, for instance, convection currents, letting the sun let maybe come through our, our, our um, big pane glass window. Uh, somewhere facing south or, or, or west and then maybe heating up the room and as it does that it creates differences within the room which causes convection currents to move air or water from point A to point B and is doing it all at, at no cost to us using physics if you if you will to kind of move the air and the temperatures around to rooms or, or other buildings uh, it doesn't cost us anything so active means you got to put energy in the system. Passive, you like natural systems kind of take over. Now, when we take a look at these active or passive heating and cooling systems, um, you have to understand there are certain components to it. And sometimes it gets kind of confusing because sometimes in a passive or an active system, we may use passive as well as active systems to make it all work. For instance, um, the first one I want to talk about is this flat panel collector. The panel or the um, the plate itself is passive but to be able to get air and water to move through those pipes you're going to need an active system to kind of push it along. So the plate itself is passive, what it does is passive but the active portion kind of does the dirty work because it's got to move some of the air or the water or sometimes the oil through this uh, um, flat plate. You'll see one in, 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 a, in a few moments. So uh, this one is, is kind of both. Uh, it is active slash passive, but the plate itself is definitely passive. Now a water pump, because it takes energy to move the impellers on the inside, that is a active. Blowers are like, kind of like a flan, fan, and that is also active. Heat exchanger is a passive system, but to move the air or the water, it's going to take some active or, or using up some energy like on a pump or a fan or a blower. But basically uh, how this works on a heat exchanger is that you have a series of pipes and they're very close to each other. And one pipe, let's say, is, is carrying the uh, heated materials uh, like steam or water. And then the other one is also steam or water that's cooled off or condensed. And as they pass by each other, they're exchanging heat from one a pipe to another. As it does that, that just is kind of following some natural physics, laws of physics, so the cool one gets warmer and the warm get, one gets cooler so you have different gradients. And of course uh, another system that's passive is an improved insulation. Insulation is just like a blanket on your body when it's cold. Um, it keeps heat and or cold in or out depending on, on what, what it is you want. So it gives you an opportunity to use something relatively inexpensively to, um, to insulate your business, your home, or what have you, uh, and do it passively. And then this other one right here, these earthen berms, it's basically when you kind of build a, a like a dam um, up on one side of your house. And what that does, it provides some, kind of like some insulation to keep the temperatures lower, for instance, the bottom half of your house, um, or block you from the late afternoon sun. So that is also a passive system. They use that a lot in, um, in the southwest, and they use it uh, as part of the landscape as well. So those are some of the components uh, active and passive systems. Um, flat plate collectors, passive with an active part in it, and then, of course, blowers 
and fans and water pumps are active. Heat exchanger is passive, but again, to get air to move through the pipes, you're going to need, or, or water, you're going to need an active system and improve insulation and earthen berms. Those are all types of passive ones.